I'm Mary Ann Caton. I work for Vanderbilt Libraries. Welcome to everyone uh, to jo who've jo who's joined us today for this wonderful panel about um, early Tennessee history and new perspectives on it. I'd like to introduce uh, Celia Walker, who is my boss and our associate librarian, uh, who runs the Division of Outreach and many other things. Thanks, Marianne. Um, I just want to extend my welcome as well from Vanderbilt University Libraries and recognize the Middle Tennessee State University Center for Historic Preservation and the Vanderbilt Press as co-sponsors of this uh, event. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Jeff Sellers, my friend and uh, Director of uh, Education and Community Engagement at the Tennessee State Museum. Well, uh, thank you, Celia, and thank you, Mary Ann, and thank you to Vanderbilt Libraries for doing this, um, to doing this program. It's certainly uh, been a pleasure to work on this project uh, all along. Uh, and it's something that uh, is, is really wonderful to get to, to share some time and spend, some, spend an afternoon uh, talking about early Tennessee history with such great scholars and with such uh, a notable adventurer as John Guider. Uh, so we're very excited about, about our program today. I hope you packed a lunch for the program because we're gonna, we're gonna journey about a thousand miles. We're gonna take two journeys, uh, each of which is about a thousand miles. And we're going to span about over 200 years of history. So we've got quite a, a lot to do and discuss in the next uh, hour or so. But it's going to be a great, enjoyable time in which we um, focus on multiple, perspe multiple perspectives of the founding of Nashville and the adventure that uh, John Guider retraced the journey of John Donaldson uh, back in 1779 and 1780. And, um, and all of that culminated into John's book here, and I have it conveniently for us. Uh, it is The Voyage of Adventure, Retracing the Donaldson Party's Journey to the Founding of Nashville. And uh, John's beautiful photographs recount his journey, which we'll see some of those in just a few minutes. Uh, and then we have essays from notable scholars in Tennessee history that we see here on our panel today. Let me uh, very briefly introduce our panel. We will start with John Guider, who, John, you're up at the top left of my screen. Uh, John is a professional photographer and adventurer and author, and uh, he is just a, a, an amazing person and someone you should uh, definitely get to know and follow on what he does. He has paddled solo journeys of the Mississippi River and the Great Loop, and in 2016, he retraced the thousand-mile journey of John Donaldson uh, from starting in the Upper East Tennessee and coming all the way through the Tennessee Valley and Cumberland River Valley, doing all this on a solo journey on a boat that he made himself called the Adventure Two, and uh, he will share his his uh, experiences with us in just a moment. Next up is Mr. Albert Bender. Mr. Bender is also a friend of mine at the museum. We've worked together on many projects. He is a Cherokee Indian writer, uh, activist, and attorney and uh, delivers the Native American perspective for this, uh, to, for this uh, book and panel discussion, too often of which is, uh, is used as sort of a tangential story of this. And, and uh, Mr. Bender does a great job of putting that as the central narrative and uh, focusing on their experiences through this uh, story. Then uh, next up is also a great friend and that's Dr. Leah Rotha Williams Jr. And uh, he is a professor of public history and African-American history at Tennessee State University. He is also uh, the founder of the North Nashville Heritage Project. And uh, the Middle Tennessee African-American History Collective is his most recent venture. And if you do not follow him on social media, uh, let me encourage you to do so. Uh, he is very active on Facebook and Twitter, and it's just a phenomenal um, uh, way to, to um, go through uh, and, and learn local Nashville history through his social media feed. Last but certainly not least is Dr. Carol Van West. If you uh, know Tennessee history, you cannot help but know Dr. West. He is our official state historian of Tennessee, uh, but most of you probably know him as the executive director of uh, MTSU's Histo uh, Historic Preservation, uh, the Center for Historic Preservation. He's also a professor of history, noted author, and uh, all around uh, great advocate for Tennessee history and the go-to source for a lot of 
uh, what we do at the State Museum. Um, so that's that's our panel discussion, each of which will will deliver their perspectives here in just a few minutes. Before we uh, do that, though, I, I think I picked the short straw and uh, was was asked to talk a little bit about the historic journey of uh, John Donaldson. And it's important to get this context before we venture into uh, John Guider's story and why his motivations for retracing that some 200 years later. This is where we go back in time to the year 1779 uh, and it's December of 1779. And we're on the banks of the Holston River at Fort Patrick Henry on Long Island. Uh, John Donaldson will be disembarking his boat on uh, called the Adventure, and he will head up and he will lead a flotilla of uh, settlers down the Tennessee River Valley. Uh, they will be leaving in the middle of winter and one of the harshest winters uh, on record and will travel the length of the Tennessee River and, uh, and, and then have to traverse the Muscle Shoals uh, down in, uh, in uh, northern Alabama, what will become northern Alabama, all the way up to the uh, Ohio River. I have a map that I'd like to share uh, here, and, and we made this map at the museum years ago, but it just gives you an idea of what uh, the journey was like, and this is a journey that also John will take. Uh, that he retraced. So this is the link that the, the, the actual Google uh, satellite image of the map. Along these points are the different diary entries that you will read about in the Donaldson Journal, journal which was written partly at least on uh, the journey itself. So this is uh, the Long Island where it started and, and traversed all the way to Tennessee River and then to the Chickamauga Indian settlements here down where, where is modern day uh, Chattanooga. Uh, and then, of course, this is the Muscle Shoals region all the way up to the Ohio River in which they traversed it upstream to the Ohio and then again upstream all the way to what would then been known as the French Lick. Now, what are they doing? Um, the traditional narrative is that they were coming and they were settling Nashville. Uh, and this is a, a, a group of white settlers sort of embarking on the wilderness and taming the wilderness. What was really the case is this was a, a, a land speculation venture. Uh, it had been set up uh, in 1775 under the treaty, a controversial treaty, I should say, and Mr. Bender will talk a little bit more about that in a minute, of Sycamore Shoals, in which uh, the, a judge in, in North Carolina named Richard Henderson and his, his um, investors formed the Transylvania Land Company. And in that negotiation, they negotiated over 20 million acres of land in central Kentucky and what would become the Cumberland River Valley of northern middle Tennessee. It was a very controversial uh, treaty, uh, some would say a legal treaty, and the, uh, the, even the Cherokee themselves were, were divided on it, particularly dragging the, the war leader Dragon Canoe. Um, during the time from 1775 to 1779, if you think back, what was going on in our, if you think back to your history lessons in high school, what was going on? It was the American Revolution. Uh, and the Cherokee had, uh, had allied themselves with the British, believing that the British would be the better ally to help stop the white settlement encroachment that was happening on the Overhill Cherokee lands. Uh, so they allied themselves with the British over the next few years, there will be a Cherokee uh, and, and, and white settler um, war that takes place. And many raids will be taken on both sides, many casualties that will be very bloody. So what we're doing is we're, we're now seeing ourselves taking this journey into a war climate, uh, into a Native American lands and through those lands to begin to get a better sense of what's happening. Also, it's another important perspective, and this will be my last, last point is that uh, plantation slavery is well entrenched now in, in, the, in the American colonies. And these settlers are not just white settlers. Um, there could have been as fully as half as, uh, of these settlers uh, be of African-American descent and uh, uh, enslaved. So what we're now looking at is also a forced migration uh, of many African-Americans. And that's what Dr. Williams will, will focus on in his, in his essay 
what was that experience like for those that did not have a choice to take this migration? Uh, and what was frontier slavery like? And then uh, lastly, what is the environmental impact? And, and how did the river system change from, um, from, from 1779 to 1780 all the way to John's journey? And Dr. West does a fantastic job of linking that time and how man has manipulated the land and manipulated the rivers to focus on, um, to, to bring us back full circle to 2016. I hope that provides a little bit of context in a very short amount of time, but I don't want to be the one speaking the most. The others need to speak. So John, let's, let's ask if you would kick it off for us. Um, could you just briefly kind of talk about what, um, what was the main impetus and what was the motivation to, to do such a journey and retrace this journey here? Thank you, Jeff, and I really appreciate it. Uh, my backstory goes maybe 40 years. Uh, for 30 years, I was a very successful advertising photographer in Nashville, and it was an incredible, incredible journey in that respect. I was graced with uh, all sorts of iconic stars like Johnny Cash and and uh, Dolly Parton coming into the studio and photographing and getting to know them. And, and, uh, and the career was very creative and energetic and uh, rewarding on a lot of levels, but there was something lacking. And what it was, was I wanted to do a project that was solely my own. Everything I did was a composite with other very creative people. And, um, and this time I wanted to be my own creative director. I wanted to be my own writer. I wanted to do a project. And I've been very influenced by writers such as, uh, um, oh, who are they? Uh, Peter Jenkins and, and um, and William Lee's Heat Moon and, 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 and their stories. And I wanted a journey of my own. Uh, and I thought in terms of walking, but I also wanted to photograph and the idea of carrying 30 pounds of camera on my back along with everything else just didn't seem reasonable. So I thought in terms of river journeys. And in 2000, Nine, I or 2003, I uh, embarked on my first journey solo paddling the Mississippi River, and it was 2,500 miles, and it was a life-changing event to say the least. Um, the timing was particularly important. At 2000, 2003, I was 54, and I had suffered from. Uh, long bouts of chronic asthma and allergies and to the point I was getting sick very regularly and my doctor told me that basically um, people with my weakened immune system wouldn't live past 55 so if I was going to do something I better do it now and I got on the river and I learned so much and it was such a being in nature was so restorative that it brought my body and my soul back to life. Um, paddling 10, 15 hours a day uh, was an exercise that just left me exhausted at the end of the night and I slept and I just grew. And I also learned the redemptive powers and the restorative powers of nature. And um, I got to see nature in a very, very special way. Um, traveling two, three miles an hour down the river in boats that um, have no motors, uh, I, was, uh, I was pretty much immune to the, um, the eyes of the critters that lived along the river River Reen, and um, and so I got to see nature in a very special way, and I got to see how the animals shared the territory with each other, and I got to see their emotions too, and 
and how they they reacted in very human ways to very similar situations and um so i realized that maybe we weren't as unique as we thought we were but the beauty of nature just engrossed me and i wanted to continue on so in 2009 i embarked on a journey called the great loop and i built my own boat it was a rowboat with a sailboat and it took me as far south as key west and all the way up the coastline to um, ontario and the great lakes and across them and down and i'd go out for two months um, every year for the next seven years and each time make about a thousand miles what i found was how adaptive the human race is, is that after two weeks, I became so comfortable with my craft that I didn't even think of beds at home. And it was neat because I didn't think of, of owning stuff. I just thought of going forward and enjoying the life that I was given. And, um, I had such a time in this boat, it became such a personal, um, almost human being to me that um, at one point I needed to name it and I couldn't come up with a name and um, it bothered me. And one day I was up on Metro Courthouse and um, I saw the plaque that talked about John Donaldson and um, and his founding of Nashville and his coming down the river way on his on his um, float boat the adventure and it gave me the name and um, so I named my boat adventure Two, knowing that I was leaving basically at the same point where he had landed almost 200 years ago over 200 years ago. And um, now that I had a name, I, I started thinking about Donaldson's journey and what it he endured and what was his motivation for doing it. Uh, he owned a thousand land, thousand acres of um, land in Virginia. He had a, his own iron mine. Um, he was a member of, of um, the Virginia Parliament. And why would he embark on such a dangerous journey? And why would he take his family with him? And I had to learn more. Um, there should be some pictures coming up. Um, yeah, uh, this is a map that it follow it is the same as Jeff's, only this was made in the uh, late 1700s. And um, it does give you a view of, um, of his course. And you can see in between the mountains and how difficult uh, a land-based journey was going to be, especially if you had to carry the wares of um, of a new settlement, uh, and uh, and then how hard it would be for the the women and the children of the families that were were coming along. So Donaldson decided to um, embark on this flotilla, uh, thinking that um, the children would be safer on a river journey. What he found out was entirely different. Uh, and he ran into all sorts of troubles, um, not only with the Native Americans, but with the Shoals. And then basically he was, he was running blind. He had no charts. He didn't know where how far the Cumberland River was from the Ohio and how he was going to get up the Ohio. And um, on board his flat boat, not only did he have his 10 family members, but he also had 
30 enslaved African Americans that uh, is just incredible to think of a boat that's 20 by 40 feet in, in length, uh, the size of a big room to, to hold 40 people and how he was going to, um, how they were gonna survive together on this incredible journey. Uh, there's some other pictures coming up. And the first section of these images will kind of show you my immersion into nature and, um, and the beauty that I saw and witnessed. And, um, and it's very important because this was the world that I lived in for two months at a time. And um, you can see its beauty. I hope that you, um, you feel the power that I felt just floating down this river and, um, and enjoying nature. The other thing, further down, you will see some images of the harsh winter that um, Donaldson had to endure. He came in the in the spring or in the summer of 1779 thinking that by Christmas uh, they would be in Nashville. Uh, what happened was that the, the building of his boat took a considerable amount of time. Uh, there was heavy rains that prohibited the building and then came the um, incredible winter and it got so cold that um, the, the rivers literally froze uh, and the water ran so low that the flat bottom boat couldn't, couldn't go forward. And um, so they were stuck until almost March and uh, and to think how the family endured that winter is just beyond me. Um, it, it, it is an incredible story. And, uh, you know, why, why he brought his family with him in the first place um, is, is um, a big question for me as well. These pictures um, give you an idea of, of the world that I immersed myself in, and um, and I, it just turns out that I I really can't get enough. The boat is wonderful. I'll uh, row it until dark, and then sleep, and find a little cove that I can uh, anchor in away from the channels and the larger boats, and. Um, the next morning I wake up and I'm ready to go again. So it is a, just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. The, the thing that I also found is how the river has changed. And of course, most of it is due to uh, the TVA and their building of these incredible uh, series of dams. Um, if you look at the elevation of, of Kingsport as opposed to Paducah on the Ohio, there's almost a thousand feet in difference. And to think that between Kingsport and Paducah, there, I think there, there are 14 dams and locks that level out the river in a stair-step pattern. Uh, it, it's just an incredible uh, feat, but it also makes it a rather dangerous predicament too. Um, most of these dams and locks were built with the idea of a life of 50 years. Uh, that time has since passed. And um, 
the Society of Civil Engineers have put out a dire warning that's saying at least 2,000 dams are uh, on the brink of failure and um, something has to be done. And besides the dams, there's the bridges that cross the river that um, are weak and unstable as well. So there is something that has to happen. There is something that has to change. Um, one of the things that the TVA did was um, not only did it flood the fields, but it put a lot of cities underwater as well. Cities like uh, Johnsonville and uh, Cuba Landing and Eddyville. It said that the TVA um, displaced over 15,000 families in the building of its watershed. And one of the problems is that it created a distrust among the local residents that continues to linger. Um, the farmers whose fields were put underwater were, were, you know, told that this would this would stop the flooding. Of course, we've seen it hasn't. But the farmers kick back and saying, "Well, now you put my fields under constant flood." And um, a lot of these these lands that were appropriated were lands that were granted to the, these people's forefathers um, for fighting in the American Revolution. And it's sort of ironic that the government has given and taken away as well. So there is a, a lot of um, distrust that is born out of, um, of these dams and waterways. Uh, I myself have, was uh, thwarted by going down the Holston at Kingsport because of the uh, of the munitions plant, and it was frustrating because um, I, I felt that you know the rivers are free and I should have the right to uh, to travel. Uh, I was stopped on a previous journey at a dam saying that uh, they weren't gonna let a rowboat through and the lock. And on this particular journey, I had, <coughs> I had 11, I have 11 locks and dams to go through and I never knew which one was going to halt me and, and kill this journey. So it is a, it is an incredible, incredible story in the book tells a little bit more and a little more coherently. Is this a good time to move on? Sure, yeah, John, these, the, 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 the pictures are just amazing and beautiful and show, show, just show the diversity of, of the landscape. I mean, just from the beauty then to the industrial, it's amazing. And one of the things I love about your book, and we will we'll, we'll kind of transition to the history side of things, but it, you also, the book also relates your story very well and you, your journal that you journaled in, uh, there are vignettes of your journal that are also in this book, along with these beautiful photographs. Uh, so it's a great way to learn the Donaldson journey in the past, but also learn your experience about the, the, the way that you experienced too. So, um, yes, thank you for that. Um, and and we can we can circle back to John here in a little bit when we go to Q and A. I'm going to be the uh, moder as moderator. I have to be the uh, the time monitor. So uh, we will uh, we'll spend about you know a few minutes on the historical perspectives and then al allow ourselves hopefully a few minutes to uh, to give our visitors our guests time to uh, ask questions. And if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the Q and A uh, bar there and we'll get to that at the end. I wanna now go to uh, Mr. Albert Bender. Let's take it back to the historical context of this, uh, of this journey. Albert, if you would uh, explain the, the Cherokee perspective, what's going on in the late 1770s uh, amongst the Cherokee nation and how do they, um, 
uh, resist uh, the this uh, what's going on in in the, during the Revolutionary War and uh, the white encroachment that's taking place on their lands. I seem to be having some technical difficulty with an image, but <laughs> that's okay. Oh, okay. We yeah. can hear you loud and clear. Okay, and, and I would say this: um, I'd rather have some technical difficulty with not having an image than seeing what has happened to uh, other people around the country <laughs> with very comical images coming up of them. Yeah, no <laughs> yes, the background of the Cherokee Nation in the late 18th century was one of a great deal of conflict with white encroachment. And this goes back to the fact that a war was fought between the Cherokee Nation and Anglo-American settlers and the British government in 1760 to 1761. And bringing ourselves uh, fast forward to 1776 and the American Revolution, there was a plethora and abundance of uh, settlers who were on Cherokee borders, and a lot of them have already crossed Cherokee borders. In fact, in 1768, <clears throat> white settlers started settlements in Upper East Tennessee. And the Cherokee Nation, rather than adopting a very defiant stand against them, decided, well, look, can't we make peace with these people? Can't we um, all kind of, as they said, get along? So the Cherokee leadership negotiated a treaty with the settlers in Upper East Tennessee to lease land for, uh, to them for agricultural, a certain amount of agricultural um, products per year and uh, trade goods. But by the time the American Revolution came along, a lot of the settlers felt that they could use this as an opportunity to take land from the Cherokee Nation and have those illegal settlements approved by the American revolutionary uh, government. And this precipitated the uh, Cherokee War of 1776, <clears throat> which started in uh, July of 1776, uh, with the Cherokee Nation deciding that they wanted to terminate the lease of the settlers and also remove any additional settlers that were across Cherokee boundary lines. The settlers, in response to this, instead of uh, acquiescing to the termination of the lease, decided that they would build forts to fight any Cherokee attempts to evict them. Dragon Canoe led a group of Cherokee warriors, along with his subordinate war chiefs, to uh, exercise their rights as landlords, <laughs> to put it quite um, frankly. And the initial phases of this war were that the Cherokee Nation was devastated and Dragon Canoe, to make a long story short, decided to move the Cherokee settlements from Upper East Tennessee to the area of Chattanooga, which would be geographically more easily defended against a settler encroachment. And this was the uh, situation when John Donaldson decided to take his trip down the Tennessee to come to the future site of Nashville. And the more I read about this and the more I write about this, the more reflection I have in terms of, we have to talk about what was the motivation of Donaldson. It was mentioned earlier that uh, by John, that John Donaldson had what, a thousand acres in Virginia. He was a prosperous planter. Why would he want to take a very dangerous trip through a Cherokee war zone? And uh, I have a couple of uh, speculations. One is that they wanted to make Nashville a military strong point for further encroachment on a Cherokee land. And then two, 
they wanted plantation land. Upper East Tennessee did not lend itself to plantations. And I think that this was a, another primary motive because they wanted to I, uh, get rich in a manner of speaking. They wanted to prosper more so than they could in Upper East Tennessee. And as I said, I've speculated on this a lot. Their journey through the Tennessee River, down the Tennessee River, was of course fraught with a great deal of resistance by Cherokee forces, but the blockade of the Tennessee River had not been put in place by Dragon Canoe at that time. Subsequent to the voyage of the adventure and those 30 other flatboats, the blockade was put in place with such military strength that no other boats or flotillas were able to traverse the Tennessee River. And the aftermath of the voyage was 17 years. Well, let's, let me be correct here. The Donaldson boats landed in 1779. Cherokee War ended in 1794. This was uh, the beginning of 15 years of bloody warfare between Cherokees and settlers in the Nashville area and the continuation of warfare in the Upper East Tennessee area. And this is where we uh, find ourselves after or subsequent to uh, the voyage of the adventure. And there are a lot more, uh, there are a plethora, an abundance of other aspects of this struggle that can be looked into, speculations that can be presented. But I will uh, end my remarks in this regard uh, at this time and uh, look forward to uh, future um, uh, venues of this type. Thank you, Mr. Bender. That that's a, a, a great, a very great synopsis of your essay. And it's a, it's a really great essay to, to centralize the role of, uh, of what was going on in the Cherokee Nation in, uh, during this event. Another, uh, another essay that is just phenomenal in the way that it uh, centralizes marginalized uh, stories and marginalized people of this era is the Dr. Uh, Lerotha Williams essay entitled Black Faces Along the Cumberland River Basin. And uh, too often in these stories and the telling of these, it's more of an anecdotal story when an enslaved person is, um, is brought up. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Williams, if you could ex uh, share with us some of the points of uh, your essay on, um, uh, on bringing those black faces and those voices and amplifying those stories. Okay. Um, first, thank you all for inviting me to work on this project and to think about African-American history, particularly during the territorial period uh, in new ways. The thing that I was challenged with was I had to try to give voice to people that were um, more or less voiceless. That is, we don't have any written record of their feelings, their emotions and so forth. So my starting point was to look at them through the eyes of the people that enslaved them. Uh, and for me, that was completely unsatisfactory. So what I tried to do was I, um, I imagined myself being part of the Donaldson party. And I tried to get a grip on how I would have felt, how I would have behaved. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, all. I, I, I reached out for help. I talked to you know, a couple of excellent um, professors of social work at TSC. And I approached them and asked them about, um, you know, what type of behavior would you expect from a person that had been completely separated from their family, forcefully separated from their families. And some of the responses I got, you know, you have some anger issues, maybe um, trust issues. You know, there are a whole bunch of things that you have to consider. 
And then historically, when I looked at this, this group, I was mindful that they were leaving very mature slave societies, right? Because they had been growing tobacco in Virginia and, and, and North Carolina for a while. But now they are coming to a place where the type of environment that they were leaving did not exist. As a matter of fact, they were going to have to create it. On a, a personal level, I thought about how this, this group would be leaving behind everybody that they knew and they loved, whether it was family or friends. And, and, and that type of departure, um, I humbly submit to you, can do something to you psychologically. And even now, now that we've made our way through the pandemic, I can kind of get a taste of it because, you know, I, um, you know, there are some family members that I have back home that I may have hugged, and I think about it the last time I hugged them would be, might be the last time that I hugged them, right? So everybody on that boat is, is confronted with these same sort of things. So I envision um, arriving here. Um, for them, it's, I imagine it wasn't so much as an opportunity, it's more of a horror show of sorts. Because in order for these plantations to come into being, they were going to have to put in the labor to make this happen. I, I consulted some friends I have with the um, U.S. Forestry Service to kind of get an idea of what they might have observed. Because, you know, my question is, well, what kind of trees would have been here? And how tall would the river came? Had been, had been, and then that's like, because, um, you know, I've, I've heard stories that a squirrel could climb a tree on the border of North Carolina and run clear across Tennessee and never touch the ground. Was it that, was that the geography? And that was so, no, no, no. There were a lot of planes here in Tennessee as well. So um, for me, the arrival, their arrival here in, in Nashville was um, was something that was very different from what they had left behind. And it was going to be the type of labor that would have been necessary to, quote, tame this environment. It would have been very similar, I think, to what their ancestors might have experienced in Jamestown in 1607. But we're mindful though, you don't have all the marshes and stuff here, right? But there's still some land that has to be tamed. And then another aspect of it that I wish I could have probed a little bit further in my SAL, although I did talk about Jack Silver a little bit in this, but um, Native American relations. I'm, I'm interested in this might be something that I pursue later on, although there has been some work done on this, but there's, there's some questions I want to answer. Um, the relationship between Europeans and, and natives in Virginia, um, from my understanding, from when I took, you know, um, that early America course eons ago, uh, it seems as though there would have been, uh, there was a lot of bloodshed in those areas at that time. And I don't see how they could have been disconnected from that being enslaved in the spaces where they were enslaved. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing a little bit further. Um, I'm interested in exploring um, Native American and, 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 and um, African American relations in this area. Now we understand that um, Jack Civil with, with, um, with his exploits, and I, when I talk about him in class, I, I rank his story right up there with Davy Crockett and the rest of the tall tales that he made about. So let me tell you about this guy. 
but um, surely he is not the, the only one. I, I, I um, as a historian, I'm curious about stories that were very similar to his. So um, I'm gonna be mindful of the time that you guys gave me, but I'll, 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 um, I'll stop there and and and, and close by saying um, this. Their rival in this in this space was an adventure. Um, there were a lot of unknowns, but having said that, there were a lot of things that they witnessed, that they experienced, at least reminiscent of what they might have experienced in North Carolina in the beginning. Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you, Dr. Williams. Your your essay just really brings out all of those different aspects of. Uh, of life uh, for an enslaved person in those in those years and that time. What what what's what what trauma and uh, that that you that they would have gone through both physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Uh, it's 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 a really enlightening way of um, researching and thinking about uh, frontier slavery. <clears throat> Last but certainly not least is Dr. Uh, West. Dr. West, your essay just really did a, a great job of bringing it full circle to helping us to understand how the land has been manipulated uh, by, by humans over the, over the 200 years. And um, I, I, I just really enjoyed it and brought a, such a new perspective to me on environmental history. Could you um, sort of link us from the historical John story uh, to the modern story? Absolutely. Well, good. thank you, Jeff. And thank you for uh, telling me to stop talking and unmute. <laughs> I want to also uh, thank Vanderbilt University Press for putting together such an outstanding book. I really urge you to go and get it. The photographs just raise all types of questions. I think you can see the essayists. They raise even more questions. And, uh, you know, John, through the photography and the journey itself, uh, Lee and Albert through their essays, they've done the heavy lifting. So I get to do the fun part of just wrapping it up. And I'll do that real quick just to remind everyone that, yes, the rivers have been there for, of course, uh, thousands of years. And they, for all of, most of that time, were very, very important means of transportation. They're still important means of transportation today. But in the last 170 years, they really have changed. And that was what I was looking at from the time of the Cherokee removal, where Ross's Landing on the Tennessee River was a gathering point for the boat trip to Oklahoma um, for the Cherokee Trail of Tears, to the coming of the railroads, and then those three words that define so much of 20th century Tennessee, the Tennessee Valley Authority, and the tremendous impact that the authority had on the rivers along with the group that sometimes gets forgotten, the U.S. Corps of Engineers. So I'm gonna, I want to hear questions from the audience. So I'm just gonna leave you with sort of my closing thought that I added in my chapter. Don't let the quiet and solitude of those handful of isolated stretches fool you. The Tennessee and Cumberland rivers of the Native Americans and and of John Donaldson are gone. John Guider's Tennessee and Cumberland rivers remain. And as his photographs show, they're compelling, still magical. And as John talked about, they still have their stretches of wildness and nature. But of course that has changed dramatically too. Today, those rivers are of man and as much machine as they are rivers of nature. So with that, Jeff, I'll throw it back to you. That's great. Thank you, Dr. West. And uh, yeah, one of the things that I learned so much uh, on this is that the river system is, as John said earlier, is a, is a uh, series of lakes now um, interspersed with, with small channels of the river. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing to think about. All right, uh, we do have a few minutes. I knew it was gonna be tough to get all this in in an hour, but we do have a few minutes for questions. And uh, I see them coming in, Celia, um, on the on the chat feature here. Um, 
one of the questions that's come in is what about the the view of the women on the trip uh and uh how could they have been prepared for this arduous journey does anyone want to uh want to take the um the the role of women on on the on the on the trip don donaldson's journey well i'll take that on um we you know the as paul clemens great work on the donaldson diary demonstrates it's both the creation of john donaldson and then his son as they wanted to make sure they had a complete record of the journey um and think of when it was written this was a time when women voices were largely silenced and you know you don't have a lot of direct information in that primary source about it but then when we pull back and think about the role of women in all sorts of uh, situations in this period of history well of course they're the glue that keeps these families together black or white they're playing a pivotal role and to me that is one of the stories in early Tennessee history, just as Albert's talked about with the Native American story and Lee in particular talking about the African American story. We need more research on that aspect of the frontier experience. The stereotypes abound and the good stories abound, but then tracing these people through time is actually now easier to do than in the past because of such mechanisms as Ancestry.com. So I would tell you, if you really want to start that process, you can go to those websites and type in the names of the women that we do know that were on the trip and then start to find out their stories. I think it's something that's been woefully neglected. We know they're important. We know they're important in many different ways and it needs to be brought out to a greater degree than it's been thus far. Um, and I'm sorry, yes. I think with um, African-American women, where they have appeared in the, the, the narrative, they um, more or less a reference as people that either felt they're an important white person or um, or, or cooked, or was a domestic, something along those lines. But um, and I think I'm during this period, I think of people who are women, black women in particular, are, are um, you know, they are passing on the curse of enslavement to all of their offspring. So I imagine that would, um, would govern some of their behavior because when they start thinking about it, they would also be the ones that would equip them, equip their children with the skills necessary to survive this 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 experience, right? Um, as 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 Dr. West was talking, I, I um I started thinking about fugitive slave ads. It's like, okay, how many of those from that period are black women and there are quite a few i although i've had my class look for this might sound kind of odd but i have been looking for pregnant enslaved black women who ran away that they were making their way through nashville and what that actually revealed about how women were moving and thinking in this period um but in closing we do it, it's, it's challenging with African-American history, but just because it's challenging, I mean, we don't need to do it, right? So we, there is still you know, much work to be done. There. That's great. That's great. You know, it's a, this is always a good time to reflect on what research needs to be done uh, and how we get to do more of that multi-narrative story uh, and researching in the, in the past um, and how important that is. The last question, uh, is appropriately enough. How do we as citizens support the regrowth of the river if uh, if it is uh, unattainable to to or uh, uh, unnecessary to get it back to what it was? But how do we support the new 
uh, regrowth and, and, and the health of our river systems. And this can be any of y'all. I know each one of you are always uh, is outdoors and, and enjoys the outdoors, but uh, maybe John, you would like to reflect on the question. Well, there, there were some wonderful groups like the Cumberland River Compact and the Harpeth Conservancy that are dedicating to the conservation of the rivers. And it's extremely important between the runoff from the farmer's fields, the that are, are growing the hydrilla and other invasive plants to the uh, to the pollution that um, comes from our sewers uh, things have to be done. And, you know, nature, given the chance can rejuvenate itself, but we're putting in a position where if if we don't act soon we're going to create a world where nature can't survive and once that happens then our survival is is gone as well so it is extremely important it is important well folks it uh it looks like we're we're all but out of time um i i, I want to i want to once again plug the book voyage of, of the adventure retracing the Donaldson Party's journey to the founding of Nashville. I know um, that the uh, Vanderbilt University Press has, um, has graciously offered this at a discount, uh, I think, for those that are registered. So um, use that access code for the discount that you get for this book. It is certainly worth it. Um, I, I can't wait to have all of these authors sign my copy uh, and, uh, and have, once again, maybe a, a, a great lunchtime um, talk with each of them. But I do want to thank you all, all the panelists. I want to thank uh, uh, Vanderbilt University Libraries. Uh, I want to thank Celia and Marianne. Thank you so much for, uh, for putting this on for us. Mm -hmm.